Yeah, hi folks. Now this is part one of a two-part video about that vulgar propaganda documentary called Web of Chaos. Now I have been forced to put the second part over on my BitTube channel because it's not permitted here. Anyway, I've uh, posted a link to it below and I urge you to go and see it. And if you wish to comment, you can comment here or over there as you wish. Now in this video, I only focus on the people who narrated that vulgar propaganda documentary. Now this is David Farrier, a so-called journalist. Given the full court press that is going on with the government uh, today, um, and basically what TVNZ planned to air tonight uh, in their documentary slot, their Tuesday documentary slot, slot is a, I think New Zealand On Air or Film Commission funded documentary called Web of Chaos that will feature amongst other people Kate Hanna from the, disinformation, the dodgy and shady disinformation project and this um, gutter snipe journalist called David Farrier who just tends to engage in character assassination against people. And the Web of Chaos documentary's prime aim by the look of it is to feed the fear over the internet and disinformation, which is all part of the government strategy to get you to give up your freedom of, willingly give up your freedom of speech. One of the reasons I've taken an interest, and look, I think you can expect a Web of Chaos to have as much journalistic integrity as Fire and Fury. Exactly. Okay, it's basically the same mould as Fire and Fury. But I think TVNZ need to pull this documentary tonight because in it they are going to represent Mr David Farrier as some sort of authority on ethical journalism and the truth. And here is a truth about Mr David Farrier. Uh, in late September of this year... Um, in late September, so that's just last month, and a, and a, a Whanganui judge issued under uh, uh, issued what's called a temporary protection order against a man who is very close to David Farrier, and against David Farrier as what is called an associate associated respondents in a domestic protection order. The woman who sought this order went to a judge and said, this person who is related to me, this friend of David Farrier's, has, along with David Farrier, engaged in activities which have terrorised me, which have physically intimidated me, which have involved the breaking of laws, the entry into my home, the vandalism of my possessions, and me being terrorised by this relation of mine. And this has been done in cahoots with Mr. David Farrier, who is a self-styled journalist and filmmaker. The judge who heard their submissions was so concerned at what they heard and found the body of evidence they presented so disturbing, so disturbing that the judge immediately ordered, without Mr. Farrier or his associate, his friend, being present, issued a temporary protection order against him and also an order that Mr Farrier and his associate attend a non-violence program specified by the court. So I'm always looking for a story that will be of interest to people. And I came across this competition online called Competitive Endurance Tickling. And it was a tickling competition, and it happened in L.A. once a month, and young men from all over the world, including New Zealand, would be flown to L.A., being paid, you know, $1,500 cash, put up in a nice hotel, and they just needed to tickle each other. And I, these videos were online, you know, it's these guys in Adidas gear tickling. And I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. And so I emailed the company. Uh, they said they needed to check with their legal department first if they could do an interview. I forgot about it for a week and then I went back and I just thought I'll post on their Facebook wall. You know, they had a page with, you know, 20,000 likes. It was popular, like it's a, you know, it's a legitimate thing. 
And I posted on their wall saying, you know, I'm a journalist in New Zealand. I'd love to interview you about this tickling sport. And they just immediately Started just fired. Yeah, I mean, the, the first comment from them was, we don't want to deal with a homosexual journalist. And so I was like, okay, this is weird because it's the sport that is, it's a homoerotic thing. You just watch this. I mean, you look at these guys and it looks, you know, it looks a little bit homoerotic, right? Man, look at those toes. Fine on over. <laughs> you got strong toes. Yeah, I'm locking that I'm locking this down. Okay, let's get serious about this. So when someone uh, needs a little bit extra? A little bit extra lubrication on their feet. Yeah. <laughs> Need I show more? Now, this is Sanjana Hato Tua, a so called disinformation specialist. Uh, tell me uh, what you want to uh, talk about and emphasize at the lecture. Uh, the lecture is uh, named after a senior editor in Sri Lanka who was uh, shot dead in broad daylight uh, in early 2009. It was the highest, one of the highest, if not the highest uh, profile killing of a journalist in, in, uh, in recent years. Uh, and it is to honor his memory and his legacy to independent investigative journalism in Sri Lanka that I suppose Sri Lankans Without Borders thought of having an annual event, the first of which will be this Saturday. The event, myself included, will feature other speakers as well. I will be coming from Sri Lanka. The others are journalists either in exile or who have left the country for whatever reason. And we'll all be talking about, including, uh, I think, a Skype video chat uh, uh, connection with uh, another ed a journalist from Sri Lanka, the situation regarding the freedom of expression in the country and media freedom post-war. It's four years after the end of the war and things are not looking good as they should be and could be. And it is our concern, uh, the challenges facing independent investigative journalism, the ongoing threats, the culture of impunity, the threats to the freedom of expression. Here, yeah, now here's this a-hole in Sri Lanka complaining about the lack of freedom of expression. But now he's in New Zealand participating in a documentary designed to silence people, designed to censor free speech. Double think hypocrisy. Now, this is Andrew Cowie, a so-called net safe educator. We, we have mistaken um, stimulus for information. And so this, is, this session is really about trying to drill into that. And what does critical thinking actually look like in the classroom, in school environments, in libraries? So we've got that kind of saccharine, very much a um, surface level uh, junk food aisle, if you will, that's happening in, our, in our, uh, our news feeds and the way we consume media and news. So that's one force. The other side of it, that journalism has become a very dangerous game. In the last 10 years, uh, 720 journalists have been killed Many, many more have been pers persecuted, have been kidnapped, have been subjected to all, all kinds of terror by different governments from around the world. Now, in New Zealand, we're very fortunate that we have um, that we have the ability to have these conversations openly, and we're able to talk to each other. We're, we're able to hold events like today. And so, I guess a message to our kids needs to be: dictators don't like freedom, so let's use ours. Yeah, but here you are participating in a documentary funded by. A, dic a dictator. Now, this is Kate Hanna, the director of the Disinformation Project, and she's well suited for the job because she's full of disinformation. So, I am concerned that I think we're seeing 
government propaganda continuously, and it's only following a certain narrative, do you think that government has done an accurate job of representing all sides of this argument and giving people enough depth and enough studies? I'm not the government, sadly. I'm not the government, sadly. You're funded by the government, though. You're funded by the government, though. Am I? Disinformation. She knows she's funded by the government. We know from historical experience of, of how white supremacism or neo-Nazism or white nationalist identity works, that there are, are always selected and groomed and duped members of minorities and women who are brought into the fold, made to feel part of the in-group and then paraded as evidence that this is, could not possibly be a racist or sexist movement because these people are part of it. Complete disinformation. She has no evidence of that whatsoever. Now that is exactly what the, the Democrats do to black Republicans. They call them Uncle Toms. Now this is Mark Delda, or should I say Mark Duldo who is a so-called reporter on the far right. Now, I recorded this yesterday. The furious world of New Zealand's far right nationalist, Mark Delder. Are we missing the rise of the far right? Mark Delder speaks to the angry middle-aged men who want to see nationalism rise in New Zealand. Well, of course we want to see nationalism rise in New Zealand, Mark, because we've seen the damage globalism has caused, or should I say, global communism. Now, this is Byron Clark, a so-called far-right conspiracy researcher, but we all know him as a far-left troll, a loser, a stupid person. It's false. It's fake. Not this time. Fiction. He made it up. A total fabrication. This one was invented by a writer. No. It's false. Fiction. Well, that one's fake. false. It's fiction. It's just not true. No. It's false. No. And they take this guy seriously. Now, this is Lisa Ellis, a so-called political philosopher at Otago University. But really, she's just another far-left loon indoctrinating your kids. Anyway, I recorded the following yesterday as well. Sectoral responsibility for climate justice. How much of the global carbon budget should we spend on international air travel? Lisa Ellis. As is well understood, the cost of adaption to climate change fall heavily on the least well-off among us, while the benefits of high carbon air transport are confined mostly, though not exclusively, to the relatively well-off. The present high carbon transport regime thus represents a transfer of climate risk from the most to the least advantaged human beings. How can we make decisions about the sectoral distribution of the global carbon budget in a principled way? So what she means is this. People who travel by plane will have to pay a tax to subsidise the disadvantaged. Typical far-left thinking. Now, folks, I'll stop it there. And, folks, remember to click the uh, BitTube link below to see part two.